There we go. So this is the OGM call for Thursday, January 19th, uh, 2023. And the first couple of times I wrote 2023, I I couldn't sort of figure out how I'd gotten as far as 2023. So there we are. <clears throat> it's just like a big number. It, it feels like you've made a dent into the century when you start getting near the quarter, the quarter mark. We're living in the future, Jerry. We are. We're living in the future we didn't imagine. Although I, for one, am glad we have Zoom and internet. <laughs> I, for one, welcome our new ant overlords. <laughs> exactly. Oh, man. <laughs> now, is that an acronym for superior intelligence, or do you just mean the, the critters? The Simpsons. Oh, okay. It's from The Simpsons. And I have not... Zoom is from the Jetsons. I have not watched enough Simpsons episode in my life. That's short you... shortcoming. Uh... You know, I resisted for a long time. I thought it was going to be really stupid, and I found out it's incredibly subversive and very sophisticated. Um, it's the same thing happened to me with Futurama. I was like, I'm going to love this series, and then I, I just didn't get hooked. It's very strange. I got hooked on The Simpsons after two episodes. Um, well, we are reconvening uh, in the spirit of improving our dialogues, and we have with us this time, instead of me experimenting with what I thought Doug's format was, we actually have Doug Carmichael with us to explain what this was and take us in. Uh, Doug, the con is yours, and I will uh, step in whenever you wish. So I'm going to run this process, and then at the end of the morning meeting, I'll talk about why we do it quite this way, because there's some interesting ideas about it. Uh, it's quite simple. Uh, what I want everybody to do is to be thinking about what in the last week was the most important thing you thought about that would make a good conversation. And what we're going to do is go around the room and have everybody speak without interruption by others. Uh, and we're going to start off by getting somebody to volunteer to go first. And when that person finishes, they pick the next person uh, who then speaks. And then they pick the next person until we've fill the, gone around the room. So I think that's pretty clear. It's just remember, it's what's been on your mind in the last week that you think is most worth a serious conversation. <laughs> so who would like to start? <laughs> Anybody volunteer to start? Uh, I'll start. Thanks, Ken. I have a pretty simple, uh, short thing that's that's really been on my mind. I'm working with a client right now, and uh, the question they're asking me is, how do we influence people that we have no uh, power or authority with, over? Um, these are folks we have to work with, and maybe they don't really want to be in partnership with us. So how do we create an environment where um, when we need something from someone who uh, is in our network and perhaps some uh, stakeholder in our company who isn't really they're reticent to work together but we need to work with them and and they don't want to actually uh meet us where we need to be met so how do we address that so pick and on the next person i will pick uh judith thanks ken um let me think for a second um I think for me, the, th the thought I had was um, how do I select the activities and the engagements that are most aligned with my long range goal of using my time to somehow make the world a better place for folks? And what are my criteria for choosing which organizations I work with or which groups I try to influence? So pass the baton to somebody. Um, Klaus. Yeah, my my aha moment this week was I've spent you know the last uh, since my retirement really uh, working on on climate food food and climate change collect connected issues. I've been trying to break into my own industry. <clears throat> I know this. You know, a lot of my former colleagues are following me uh, on LinkedIn. But I've been trying to get someone to actually act on 
what it is that we know about you know uh, a changing climate and its impact on the food system and i gave up about six years ago <clears throat> working as a consultant because i ended up working on theme parks and you know, stuff like that and joined ngos and worked you know worked my way into several NGOs sort of in an advisory function. I mean, you know, Mr. the Sierra Club and the National Grassroots Network. But I keep trying you know, to link up with my industry. <clears throat> and so well, can, I, can I get you to state what the issue is that you've been thinking about and uh, let us fill in the details later? Well, yeah, the core issue is that um, the all these high tech um, innovations that are coming into the food sector <clears throat> in the, particularly in biotech and so on none of them consider the impact they are having on ordinary people and what they how that will impact their lives um, because food you not know, being at the system of the pyramid uh, of, uh, of of our needs um, deeply impacts the way we live, the way we uh, function, our health, our well-being, and everything around us. And you can't get a company, no matter what size, to think it's any of their business that they should worry about what that does to people you know, <clears throat> living in the inner cities, living in rural districts. You just can't make the connections. It doesn't sink in because you can't make any money there. So that's that's my big beef this week. Gil, you want to go next? <clears throat> Let me pass for a moment, please. Choose someone else. Can you then pick someone else? Okay, I'll pick Pete. Okay. Thanks, Klaus. Um, uh, the most important thing I thought about this last week is it seems like small, but it's also really big. Um, how can individuals know what's true and what's not? Um, how do we know what to believe? Um, I'll pick Stacy. Um, I've been thinking sort of a combination of what Pete and Ken are talking about, but mostly I've been thinking about how we have many solutions, but sometimes we're trying to force a certain solution in the wrong direction. And what I mean by that is sometimes there's an overcorrection where it's almost like if you give medicine to a healthy person, you make them sick. And I think I'm seeing a little bit of that in looking to find a balance between male and female energy. Stacy, pick the next person. Oh, I'm sorry, um, Doug. Which one? Oh, What's I'm sorry, Doug. Doug B. Doug B. <clears throat> um, well, this week, week, this last week, um, I had someone suggest um, a share I made to to her was my dharma uh, reason for being here. Um, but it revolved around the idea that the source of all of our ills are the law and the current legal system. And um, having people give that up requires offering them a replacement. And, um, and the dots that connected for me because of my elemental work is, uh, um, that the true natural law are the five elements and that um, we could actually replace current legal systems and structures with elemental pr principles, which are the prevailing um, reality that we live in and that actually govern what happens in it. So that's, that's me. And who hasn't gone? Rick or Eric? I'm not sure. Have either of you gone? Rick, you want to go first? Next. Um, you know, I, I want to thank Doug for presenting this format. I, I was in another group and we were struggling with how to use Zoom more effectively. And what I'm particularly interested in is, is the notion of co-creating generative dialogues. 
and getting away from our sort of talking head type of presentations or regurgitating our scripts that we've said many times before, where you actually say something original that triggers somebody else to come up with an original thing. And the sharing of that sort of novelty and creates a different um, sort of space of transformational collaboration. So that's what I'm interested in. And, you know, the difficulties is how to create some simple rules for Zoom to do that. And I'll just share the evolution of the thought, which is not complete, in trying to facilitate this. Um, and that is how to create a thread. Uh, I mean, this is what we're doing now is divergent, it's agenda setting, whatever. There's merit to that. There's no question it's good to know what's on top of people's minds. But if you want to go into a theme of something, then an, an evolving theme that can go off in different directions, depending upon the flow that's the, the collective flow of the group. Um, is when somebody speaks, it's sort of a, a, a you know, just like a uh, 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 using the talking stick. But the problem is, is you don't have the same cues in a in a Zoom environment of no, you're not watching everyone in the same way if you're in the room, and you get a sense of people's energies of how it's you know emerging. So the, the ideas we came up with is that when you respond, you respond to what the person's saying first. And then you can, you can ask the person to respond to your response so that it's not serial monologues. But to add a twist to it, you can either have one finger or two finger, and you can't put them up until the person's finished speaking. Because once I, I, I experienced when people, a lot of people, you know, when people put their hands up, it's sort of, you know, your thinking changes because of what the previous person said. But if, if you allow people to spontaneously say, I, I just want to respond, or I want to respond and add, and then go back to the person to respond to it. So it creates a more of a, a dialogic format. And so anyway, that's what I'm interested in, how to create uh, Zoom experiences where there is a theme or a question you start off with and let the group co-create emerge new ways of thinking understanding etc so that's what what comes top of mind for me and by thought is eric the last one do you say is there I, I, i'm just yeah thank up. you okay okay i'm gonna paste and chat my the thoughts that popped into my mind today um but it's up to us whether we want to talk about that or something else um I think I just feel a sense of acceleration since the year started. And I don't know if we're accelerating off a cliff or what. So I'll leave it at that. Okay, you want to pick a next person? We've got several still to go. Oh, Stuart, did you go? No, who, who else is no. left? No, yes. I'm left. I'm still left. Hi. Okay, oh. Gil. Gil. Yeah. Jerry. Okay, Gil. Muted. Um, how, um, how will we get through the next two years? Better position for the next 20, not worse position for the next 20. And like I can the next person, Stuart. Stuart. Uh, yeah, so, um, Stuart, what we're doing is what's been most on our mind in the last week that's worth a serious conversation. Thanks. No, I heard the direction. Thank you, Doug. Um, so what, what's up for me here is um, the notion that um, <laughs> the U.S. Congress is literally driving the bus over the cliff. <laughs> and we're all sitting here watching it. They're driving the bus over the cliff. Uh, and and, and what, what that evokes for me is, you know, the, the words of the Declaration of Independence of the people, by the people, for the people, not of the congressman, for the congressman, by the congressman. And the egoic thinking is just, you know, um, it's just rampant. And, and that's a microcosm and a macrocosm that we're, we're living in, in terms of the uh, underlying thought processes that we've all been um, uh, brainwashed. I mean, they could be doing a whole lot of good, but you know, here we are in this uh, <clears throat> in this in this morass. So, pick the next person. I will pick who hasn't gone yet. Uh, Michael. Mm -hmm. 
Hi, Al. Um, I've been thinking about something that relates a little bit to what Stuart was just saying about driving off a cliff. Um, and uh, it's the, the easily seen difference between um, responsibility and cooperation among members of a not dysfunctional family um, that, um, you know, where a baby isn't competing with an adult and, you know, a stay at home person isn't competing with a, a, someone going out in the workforce, they're figuring out how their interaction works for the entire family, you know, and an elder is, is looked after and not expected to make their own way. And versus the notion of competing individuals in a capitalist world, particularly, but, but in general, you know, people competing for resources opposed to understanding that sharing their resources and skills and abilities is the way to succeed. And um, the scaling of that, you know, which has been successful and unsuccessful among certain families, tribes, communities, states on up um, over the millennia um, and, and trying to figure out how we can, obviously, you know, the ideal is that we reach a state as a global family where the circumstances of the least able of us or the most threatened of us is important to the most resourced or able of us. And we just naturally are, are moved to take care of ourselves as a whole family. Um, Mark, and can, I get, to, can I get you to stop there and pass on? Sure, yeah, I'll do that. And I'll pass on to um, Carl. Carl, what we're doing is what's been on our mind in the last week. It's the most important thing for our conversation. Okay. Um, obviously, the, the craziness of being, I'm inside the Beltway and <laughs> work for the government. So, I mean, this, um, the situa uh, situation is kind of crazy. I guess that's sort of the short term and then the, the longer term stuff is, I mean, we got to, um, all this stuff that's, uh, it's like they talk about seven generations and stuff, but every generation is a seventh generation or your, you've got the connections for the generations plus or minus three of yours and things. So, um, yeah, that's um, that's kind of where my my thoughts have been um, on stuff. Really looking at some of the long term st um, strategies and scenarios. It's kind of what I've been looking at. So I'll stop there because I'm not sure if I have the right context or not. So I think anybody not gone yet besides me, Jerry and John and Mark. And, <laughs> oh, there's jo John. You. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, yes. Well, at the risk of just going with the headline as opposed to something I've been cooking all week, I just got the headline or the YouTube this morning about uh, artificial wounds, uh, some company putting this out. And it was, it, the reaction to it included the possibility that it was entirely fake, but if it was even half serious, it opened up all kinds of uh, issues immediately in terms of um, the most obvious Brave New World 1984-ish one would be a state manufacturing people of, of, and ensuring their loyalty because it manufactured them. 
so that that was pretty uh, nightmarish thought. So that's worth discussing. And uh, is anybody else who's left? I can't see the screen. Jerry and Mark. Okay, Mark, if you're there. Yeah, I'm here. Take it. Um, so in terms of, of this week in, in particular, I've been part of a, a group of sort of finance sector uh, and climate change. And it's been intended to be an advanced sort of expert dialogue, 60 people. Uh, and it's and it's just been maddening. I mean, it's done by email and or, and it's just a serial monologue that that literally just every 60 seconds I get a ping that there's a new email in my box and a, a new post on the system. And um, I, I just can't figure out what the point is at all. And and yet everyone in the group seems perfectly happy with this serial monologue that that will go nowhere over the course of five days of dialogue. Uh, so so that that's certainly been on my mind this week. Jerry? Thanks, Doug. Um, inspired a bunch by the conversations we have had about sense doing and other sorts of things and just thinking about the things we would like to sense do about, uh, the top question that's on my mind is how do um, how do you build sufficient trust that people will soften enough to lower anger and fear to cooperate to make their lives better in any way they want, that, that, that they need? Because I think that that's a formula for dissolving some of our dilemmas in the world right now. Like, uh, there's a couple layers to it, but, but that's kind of the formulation I've got in my head right now. So I think we've gone around everybody. I'm going to leave myself out for the moment. Uh, at this point, uh, we've been stimulated by what everybody's been thinking about. So the floor is open for wherever it wants to go. And the only nudge is because you know you're being listened to, try and keep it short. So since we have this quiet, I'm going to stick myself in. What's been on my mind this week is the conundrum of new economic activity creates new relationships. Relationships tend to be a little sticky, which means that it makes change even harder. Uh, if you imagine 100 people gathered shoulder to shoulder in the middle of a football field. Uh, any one of them can move through the group th with a little resistance. If everybody reaches out and grabs the arm of the person nearby and holds on, nobody can move. And that's kind of what's happening in society right now. We're increasing activity, which creates relationships, which are sticky, which increases the glue, which means change is even harder. So that's what's been on my mind. And so in the spirit of um, jumping in on conversations, um, I'd love to just jump into what you just said, Doug, uh, partly because I'm unclear that stickier relationships, which I think means more trusted relationships, and here you can bring in the weak ties versus strong ties work uh, and other things like that, but I'm unclear that stickier relationships mean less change uh, directly, That that the binding somehow prevents motion. Um, there, are, there, are, there are group dynamics that clearly do that. Like this is how cults operate. They create extremely sticky relationships where there's no leeway for, for, for change, innovation, or trying to break out of the cult. But that's not what I think of as regular, the, the stickiness in social interactions. Sorry, Doug, I just wanted to add that. Yeah, an example is uh, the states which have passed laws which make it illegal to, to put new transmission lines across the state line. So that makes doing a new grid almost impossible. Sorry, uh, how's, how's that an example of human because relationships you have being these contractual regulatory relationships? So I'm... contracts uh, is one form of relationship. Laws are one form of relationship. And they just make things sticky. Um, so yeah, I totally agree. Anybody else who wants to jump in, please do. Uh, for me, like 
laws are a way of trying to pour concrete around social arrangements. And so sticky, like very sticky, if you prohibit things, you know, like uh, we are currently trying to stop, I'm currently trying to stop the US from becoming the handmaid's tale uh, because it seems like a bunch of people wanna make things very sticky on that front by passing laws that prohibit uh, really legitimate healthcare interventions, which is crazy. And so I did not think you were talking about laws. I thought you were operating at some other level. So I was I was jarred when you brought in uh, laws in that sense. Anybody else thoughts? Doug B. And you're muted. There you go. The um. Your your the definition, Joe, you just shared. <clears throat> which is law as a sort of agreement by and between. Um, relationship and agreement alone doesn't equal law. What the word law definitionally requires is that the agreed conventions by and between that the violation of that agreement, breach of that agreement, carries a penalty. It is the enforceability of the agreement by that mechanism that is fundamental to the law and the legal system. If you shift orientation, and drop the penalty for failure to comply or align or, or behave in conformity with, and you shift orientation to the why that happened and what's needed to help those not in compliance, it changes the whole equation and orientation. As, as a contribution. Thanks, Doug. Uh, Stuart. So I just wanted to throw into the mix that um, from, from everybody's comments, um, and I'm thinking specifically at Gil because I'm looking at his face when he said, you know, how are we going to get through the next two years? We've got all these things percolating. Um, the war in Ukraine, climate issues, food issues, um, legal issues, uh, governance issues, and they're all percolating. And, um, and I'm reminded, and I think I've said this here in this call before, from my, my, my time in the, um, you know, when I was doing a lot of mediation, ah, and the mantra used to be, oh, they haven't felt enough pain yet. And <laughs> in, in all of these things that are percolating, it's not, mass pain. We haven't felt that. I found myself last week, you know, in response to a lot of friends saying, how are you doing in these terrible mass floods in California, saying that I'm dry, feeling kind of like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm one of the fortunate ones. But um, maybe what we need is a mass event to really wake more and more and more people up Although my sense is if that happens, um, people will continue in their same um, individual and personal carping and, and won't, uh, won't start to let go and, and, and see the collective. Um, Jerry, you mentioned softening. You know, and I think that that's exactly what I, I, I was just kind of pointing at. Thanks, Stuart. Uh, Klaus? Yeah, in this in the same vein as Stuart was just mentioning, um, I think we need to have a common agreement about the peril that we're in as a collective. And um, the only you know the, uh, real example that comes to mind that is more contemporary would be World War II, the mobilization that took place during World War II, but only after Pearl Harbor happened and. You know, when you look back historically through a lot of uh, 
um, interactions that took place before the U.S. engaged um, and, and really did this mobilization. So the internal conflicts at the time were very similar to what we have today. You know, we had an active Nazi party, you had all kinds of uh, uh, streams within, the, within society. It wasn't until this became a real existential threat where you could see long term, this is uh, a serious disruption. Um, that could that could imperil you know the United States itself did did it really engage but once that happened when you think about the the uh implications right when you converted a, an automobile factory within six months to roll out tanks or another factory that within a really short period of time produced airplanes and then mass produced these things think about what it takes to make that happen there had to be some engineer who was working on an assembly line before making cars, who now had to figure out how do I change this? And you could not direct this top down. It had to be built bottom up where everybody in this factory knew what the uh, intended outcome was, right? And, and self-directed, self-mobilized here. And that's what it will take right now. We will really need um to have a collective understanding where people self-mobilize to do the right thing meaning you know we need to restore our environment we need to have uh, uh, uh we need to protect our food supply we need to have people who are at the low end of the economy not just in the us but period to to help them to help themselves right because people who are desperate will cut down the last tree to live another day so you, so you can't let people get desperate, right? You have to prevent desperation in the uh, uh, base of pyramid economy. And so to, for, for that to happen is a mindset shift. It's a reformation that needs to take place where, where, where our own instincts you know, tell us to cooperate because I need to help somebody who is helping somebody to fix stuff kind of mentality. And, and I think we're getting pretty close Unfortunately, um, we can't afford to get much closer because then we'll have crashed through tipping points where you know, it's going to be too late. Um, Doug, I've kind of stepped in as traffic director here. Would you rather like uh, run the room? Uh, I let it let it self manage itself. Okay, I will stop managing it. So I'm going to come in just as a person, uh, Klaus, uh, in the example of World War II, the factory already had relationships which could change what they were doing. Uh, the whole society was organized around laws that uh, could be implemented uh, through the structure of Congress and the president's office uh, to respond to the crisis. We don't have those structures now that could play that role. Yeah, on top of it, it's global, right? Because the globalization, the World Economic Forum has more influence and power than any individual government. So, so clearly, um, what would have to happen is that the elites, the financial elites, are really control. You know, very few people really control. The, the core levers of the uh, economy would have to come to the conclusion that uh, uh, we need to change course here and we need to engage sectors of the economy that we never paid any attention to. So the, so government has always been like in a mediating role, right? Because to, to maintain social systems uh, that, that you know, perpetuate you know, society as a whole, but the, with the loss of, of influence by individual governments, you have companies supersede this power and, and social systems have been degrading ever since. No, not ever since. I mean, they have been degrading. <clears throat> you know, um, maybe the elites need to come around to this point of view, or maybe there needs to be a different kind of power structure in the world, right? Uh, I would disagree with Doug. Uh, I think the structures are there, but they're being fought over and seized and directed in different ways than they had been uh, had been intended or had been in previous years. I've been I've been asking um, folks what might it be like 
if we did business as though we actually belong to the living world and as though we actually belong to each other. And I guess the variation on that question that comes to mind, Klaus, listening to you is what does it take for us to come to that belief? Uh, us in the broad, in the broadest possible sense, yeah. uh, um, and uh, you know, as, as a and, and it's a profound shift in worldview. It's one that humans have lived in for uh, tens of millennia, but not lately. Um, I'm reminded, listening to you guys, of um, a, a sort of weird joke that the great Ray Anderson used to tell of of somebody who um, uh, leaps or falls or tries to fly off the top of the Empire State Building. And as he's plummeting toward the ground, he's passing the 83rd floor. Someone opens the window and looks out and says, how are you doing? He says, pretty good so far. And, you know, that's the mood that most folks are living in is we're pretty good so far. Uh, I think most people don't have any grasp of the scale of the calamity, of the ecological calamity that we may be facing. Certainly no grasp of exponential growth. Um, you know, tap any... Tap any hundred people on the street, and how many of them know that seventy percent of insect species are gone? You know, and that ninety percent of top fish in the oceans are gone. Um, and um, you know, and that, and you follow that trend further. It doesn't look very nice, but you know, who knows that? No, it's not. It's not discussed. It's not reported on. And even there, you know, the sense of how that the rate of change changes. It's you know itself is just is not in the common mind. So how do we learn to be part of the living world and act as if? Rick, you're muted, so we don't hear you. I was just using my one finger as a signal that I wanted to respond to Gil um, and to Mark. And um, I, I put a question in there about uh, the issue of pain. How much pain will it take? And I, I think we're, as I said in this little entree, we, we're, we're living in a narcotic age of wokeness, denial, misinformation, disinformation. So we're sort of numbed and we're not responding, but we're also building on what Mark was saying. We're, we're ineffective, we're ineffective collaborators. We don't know how to come together with a, a communitarian way of moving beyond the hero's journey, et cetera, which is remarkably ineffective, which means we have to think about working together in a very different way than we have been doing because the magnitude of the problem is so enormous. Then, um, well, we, uh, by the way, there, uh, Ken, I, I, I would say we in terms of uh, people who aspire to be change agents. I'm not talking about we. Uh, the royal beyond that, people who feel like they want to take on the challenge to see if they can uh, improve uh, and address the problems we are, which I think uh, almost everyone in this room probably would like to work towards. But the question is, how can we do it together? One of the things that we've done as a, as a culture, as a society, um, we've taken all the indigenous wisdom and put them on reservations. We, we've just crowded people into these little reservations. <clears throat> and, um, and, and these are the folks who have a different psychology. It's no wonder that there's so much alcoholism on, on Native American reservations because um, being forced to live in a in a in a concrete created man create person create human created world um, caused this incredible level of ennui and 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 that that's the place to find some connection to the natural world as a beginning. I'm reading you know a a, a little book now. Um, by a guy named Four, Hour, Four Arrows, who also has a um, uh, an American name. Um, he's a PhD professor in <laughs> multiple universities. I can't think of his name, but it's it's quoting the wisdom of Sim, uh, Sitting Bull, um, which is just kind of eye opening in in, in in so many different ways. 
And just coincidentally, there's a lot of reference here, has been a lot of reference to um, collaborating in a different way. My, my daily poem today is called Agreements, which I'll be happy to read at the end if, if people want to hear it. Stacy, you had your hand up, please go. Yeah, this is actually what I've been thinking about this week. It didn't come to mind before, but what I wanted to respond to Gil and to you is, can we actually live with the natural world if we don't address our own human centricism? I don't know if human centricism is actually a word, but I think that we all have some of it and we may not be aware of that. Carol, don't wait for anybody to direct you. Just jump in if you want to. And uh, yeah, um, yeah, four hours is one of the professors at, at Fielding where I'm going to school. So I've had many conversations with him. And yeah, it's, um, yeah he's, his, a lot of his passion is about this um, decolonizing the curriculum is a big, big part of that. So. Actually, a lot of the stuff that ties together, I've had ideas that I'm going to be pitching for a, a fielding symposium or a series and things. So that's one of my one of my projects for the for the year. Yeah, I mean, there's so much. Um, well, I brought it up before, but yeah, I've had ideas. Um, I did. I have to do a lot of writing too. I've been it off but one of the ideas I have is about a Pascal's wager revisited and uh, Pascal um, yeah it was basically there is a God there isn't a God you live a virtuous life you, you live like there's not a God so it was eternal salvation eternal damnation you live a virtuous life or you uh, it doesn't matter <laughs> kind of thing so the you should live a virtuous life. And I think we can apply the same kind of thing to um, climate change and the problem. So yeah, I have uh, ideas for uh, Pascal's wager revisited. So Carl, I've, I've had a similar thought before and I don't, I don't, I have never gone into Pascal's wager in enough depth. And I'm wondering if anybody else in the Zoom has done so. My understanding of Pascal's wager is, well, just in case there is a God, you might as well act well, because in that case, you're going to be okay, you know, when you're judged in the afterlife, even if you don't happen to believe in God. And so for me, one of the things I've puzzled over about climate change deniers is, hey, let's just, what what if this thing is actually sort of off its wheels? Uh, wouldn't it be, wouldn't it benefit us to sort of do some work to mitigate climate change? That, and and I, I'm wondering if that's the same interpretation you had, and I'm wondering also if I'm misinterpreting Pascal's wager. Yeah, um, the Stanford um, Encyclopedia of Philosophy. There, there, I mean, it's it's amazing. You've had uh, centuries of of theologians and and philosophers like. Um, arguing these exquisite argu arguments and stuff. And it's like, it's a mathematician. I mean, he's, he invented, or he's the one who brought together probably in statistics, so he could have an advantage rolling dice. So my, uh, my main premise is that that was a thought experiment about infinite payoffs and stuff. So that's one aspect of it that I'm kind of looking at. So it would be getting into game theory and all this type of stuff too, but maybe that's somebody, is that somebody else's dissertation or <laughs> I've got about <laughs> at least a dozen. Mm -hmm. Let, let's go to Gil. Part of the, uh, part of the climate denier world is the folks who believe in the rapture, uh, you know, and don't care about <laughs> it. They're focused on an afterlife. And in fact, some of those folks think the sooner the better. Um, which is kind of analogous to the folks earlier who are talking about it. Maybe it's got to get worse. There's not enough pain, uh, which reminds me of the line from some of my old Marxoid friends, which drove me crazy about heightening the contradictions of like, let's make stuff worse so that the, to build the revolutionary potential so things will blow up and change. 
And it always struck me as a not, not only cynical, but deeply immoral way to view the world. Um, um, you know, so my, my question, I think it was back to you, Stuart, is, uh, you know, do, you, do we just have to wait for stuff to get so bad that people pop or are there ways to encourage uh, and nurture a less, uh, <coughs> less crazy transition? Yeah, um, I, think, I think it's back to. Um, <coughs> let, me, let me say one other thing. There's that old quote that's attributed to Churchill, but apparently it's not him. That uh, that Americans can be counted on to do the right thing after they've exhausted all other possibilities. Yeah. yeah. So maybe humans only get intelligent when our backs are utterly to the wall, and we've you know everything else we've tried has failed. I don't know. Yeah, it's 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 in what just popped up in my mind, Gil, is is you know Al Gore's famous statement climate change, you know, denial is not just a river in Egypt. Um, and we know what to do. We know what to do. In other words, you know, we, we, we could do mass transformation of human psyches, human programming, um, where we are. We could do mass <clears throat> education. You know, I don't think we have a resource problem on this planet. I really don't. I think we have a distribution problem. I think if we if we figured out how to how to create uh, <clears throat> basic needs for everyone, um, you know, we could we could turn this into heaven on earth. Uh, but the the will is not there, and people's psychology uh, seems to mostly go in the in the in the in the opposite direction. Mark, and that just may be my fantasy. <laughs> Um, good morning. I apologize for uh, joining this late. Um, I have had a uh, incredibly wonderful um, weekend and couple of days, and I'm kind of really mistrusting. Like it feels like somebody has the finger on the positive scale, and just I'm hitting all the green lights and um, having incredible conversations, and I'm really not sure what this conversation is about, but I'm reminded of a couple things. Um, one is one of my favorite lines from a comic book. I completely refuse to admit that I'm in denial. <laughs> and uh, so I've healed from cancer, hopefully, although um, the, uh, you know, cure, um, of the chemo um, has incredible side effects, um, including, you know, chemo brain confusion. And I've just been, you know, doing the right things. And I feel oddly enough, smarter than ever. And I don't trust that as well. I don't trust kind of this feeling of invincibility. Um, talked to the doctor yesterday and they said, yeah, that could be a mania. We really want to pay attention to that. And, um, um, so, you know, hopefully I'm wise and smart enough to, um, yeah, follow through on this. Um, yesterday was a cancer um, uh, group um, called uh, the UCSF Survivorship Wellness, um, put on by their psycho-oncology department. And um, oddly enough, the uh, theme was dealing with uncertainty. And so I've been, uh, you know, it was just a, one of these, you know, synchronicity coincidences that, um, you know, it was just like, oh my God, this is really too cool. But one of the um, participants said, you know, she no longer fears death. And it was a real um, opening and awareness and blessing for her. And I had to reflect and go, yeah because of a lot of the work I've done and through the shit I've been through, I am absolutely no longer in fear of death. And it's just like, you know, um, every day I wake up, that's a good day, uh, but it's not part of my psychological complex anymore. And damn, what it used to, um, and I just feel it's such a blessing. Um, go ahead, um, Gil. Um, just on, on that, Mark, how has that shift affected you? What's different in your life with that belief di being different? 
the honest answer is I don't know yet. So my research has mm. to do with the assumption that feeling, human feelings are real. They're as real as you know the atomic number of lead being you know a certain number. They're as real as two plus two equals four. There is a you know reality um not only to communication to life to intelligence but also on a much deeper level feeling is something that moves people um it moves animals um you know there's lots of science fiction that you know it's another dimension where other beings live um and and certainly religious um tradition as well and um to tell you the truth gil i just don't know yet um oddly enough um one of the other coincidences was i've kind of trying to research this multivariate polar coordinate system for threat detection but also friendship of and closeness of say a brother or Mark, um, can I get you to be a little aware of time sharing? Sure, I will. Um, sorry about that. But basically, how do I how do I visualize either threats or love um, of a group of people in a visual and interactive way? Um, and I'm I'm you know just starting to play with this. Um, thanks for the question, Gil. I don't know. Um, and Doug, go ahead. Yeah, um, Mark, you and I at some point should connect. We have more commonalities that are uh, visible to the universe. Um, so I just wanted to correlate some loops. Um, Klaus, you mentioned the mobilization in World War II. And there's a, there's a, there's a subtext to that. Um, Roosevelt was confronting a country that did not want to get involved. And John Toland wrote a book on Hitler and uncovered that Roosevelt knew about Pearl Harbor two days before it happened. And he did not take any action to mitigate the damage because he felt he needed that in order to catalyze the country into engagement in World War II. That was a deliberate decision rooted in using the human mechanism of fear to motivate that collective bottom-up activation. And fear has been, to Mark's comment about the emotions, fear has been the principal tool driver for our, you know, for the developed world and cultures, um, almost from inception. And the evolutionary shift, and the question is whether as a species we're evolutionarily up to the task of doing it is transcending motivation by fear and scarcity and actually shifting orientation into um, love and care and inclusion and a value set that uh, is oriented toward what's needed to enable balance. each in service to each other um, versus the competitive dystopic nightmare that we are in the middle of now. So I think we have Mark up next, Mark Traxler. Uh, yeah, just a couple of follow-up uh, points. One, you know, for many years ago, there was this theory that once we had some real climatic events, i.e. hurricane flooding New Orleans, that that would be the trigger point for people responding to climate change. 
And, and it, now that we've had a whole series of sort of empirical tests of that, it, it turns out it's not true that, that as people experience that kind of disaster, all they want to do is recover. They don't want to think about alternatives and new strategies and new worlds. They just want to get back to where they were. And, and so it turns out that's the hardest time to actually influence their thinking about some of these issues. So, so that's a real challenge in terms of waiting for the waiting for the big one, so to speak. Um, the other just point is that we, we always talk about sort of the climate denialists, et cetera, but I'm always struck by the fact that, that based on a bunch of different research out there, you know, there are 100 million people in the US who are alarmed or concerned about climate change. 100 million people. About 50 of them actually know what they could do most effectively to tackle climate change. In other words, basically no one. Everyone says, I recycle, which has nothing to do with climate change. And so you know, we've got this massive group of people out there. And if we wait for them to figure this out on their own, we're going to be waiting for a long time. And yet there are no, we have no structures out there to sort of inform people on a day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month basis where they could be most effective at any given time in tackling one piece, one chess piece on the chessboard of making progress on climate change. And I think it's, it's remarkable that we, we keep talking about all of these issues so much, and yet some basic structures for helping people be effective simply don't exist. And I'll stop there. Jules? I think the common theme that's coming to mind for me is two things actually, whether or not there's any sense of connection that people feel with anything, because it feels to me like we've become very disconnected, which then means we, that tends to lead to disengagement and other things. And I think also that the vast majority of humans don't spend a lot of time thinking. They're so engaged in doing. And if you're doing without thinking, then it's not very effective. I don't know how to remedy either of these two issues, but I'd be interested in what people think. Yeah, I would argue there are actually structures available to engage with because in every community, We have literally a dozen NGOs who are working to help uh, people who have fallen on hard times or are impoverished or children who need uh, support because we have millions of children living in the street and being food insecure. I mean, we have conditions that are just that are just incredible, but the resources don't go there. And when you when you raise awareness that the help really needs to get into these communities when you have when you have food deserts and people living in the street and so on you can't make any money there this is not um, a commercial zone um, that uh, allows a top-down approach where you know you create a product in or a franchise or what have you and then you roll it out and become a billionaire so there's the 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 resources currently i mean enormous billions of dollars are going into greenwashing schemes, they're going into all kinds of uh, investments that have no uh, impact on helping people that uh, that need to become self-sufficient as a first step and, and need to be secured. So it's simply a matter of reprioritizing and, and enabling. I mean, I constantly run into uh, the issue that people who really want to help others are constantly begging for money. You know, they have to donate their time, and then lo and behold, they may get a grant someplace, right? But it is just amazing. Whereas on the other hand, people who really have talent, technical skills, engineering skills, thinking skills, they are busy, you know, thinking about the next invention that is going to make them a millionaire. So, so there is this. Uh, so the, the infrastructure is there. We just need to pay attention to it and resource it. Yeah. Well, it's, it's my feeling that anytime you put money into a project, it generates activity which creates more CO2. Hmm. Is that 
part of where we're stuck? I, I, I'm not sure I agree with this, that, um, because you can put money into um, uh, you know, local programs that, that assist people to find housing, to build communities, to secure their food supply. That does that does the opposite. You can you can invest carbon negative. Absolutely, it's possible. I'll go. I I liked I liked hearing what Judy said. Um, that it feels like we've become very disconnected, and I think it's actually something different. Um, uh, what I think is that people can't really imagine stuff bigger than your extended family. So when we see population scale things happening, um, it's, it's not that anybody's directing that. It's an emergent property of lots of small, many, many small groups kind of interacting. So you can kind of imagine the size of your extended family and whether or not they're doing well and whether or not that extended family is doing well or whether you want to partner with them or whether you want to fight with them. Um, maybe you can imagine, maybe some of us can imagine, you know, I've got a gang of thugs um, and I'm going to run around and, and take things from other, other extended families. Um, and then maybe there's there's kind of viral effects. Uh, we obviously people, you know, can move in millions uh, one way or another way in in opinion. But that I think is not thinking. It's not thinking about let let me move with a million people. It's a lot more like uh, lemmings. And of the million people, I can see you know twenty or thirty or fifty in a few extended families around me, and they seem to be moving towards the cliff, and I should be moving towards the cliff. Oh my God, why wouldn't I move towards the cliff? Everybody else is. So I, I think where we find ourselves is imagining that the United States or the world is the 20 or 50 people in an extended family and try to have a lever to move it because in the same way that I would move 20 or 50 people in an extended family. And it's just a like, you know, like three or four or five orders of magnitude different in scale. And that amount of scale is just something that's really, really, really hard for any of us to navigate. And I think that's the problem. The problem is we see problems, we want to work on problems, but we don't know how to move people in more than a group of, you know, 50 or 100 or 200 or maybe a thousand. Thanks. So again, synchronicity, I've been talking about this with many different people. And as part of the Internet Archive, um, we serve millions of people a day for free. Um, we have been raising incredible um, amounts of money, I think, um, as donations. Um, we had a, a D-Web meetup last night where brilliant people working for the good all met each other. There are nonprofits that... Um, in local Bay Area that get together um, at least twice a year and you know, uh, Electronic Found Freedom Foundation, Wikipedia, Internet Archive, um, uh, you know, the the neighbors um, I live next to, we we try to, you know, exchange numbers in case of emergencies, um, you know, working at many different levels of scale. Um, uh, our truck, um, Internet Archive truck got stolen. Uh, we posted on Reddit. Um, somebody found it in Oakland, and uh, um, we're getting it back. And uh, I'm proposing that um, at least one panel, um, the kids at the Sutra Elementary School, half a block from the um, Internet Archive, um, are you know, given a donation or supported to paint one panel of the truck, um, and then you know engage other artists in the Bay Area. Um, I just. You know, and you know the recent experience of you know having cancer and being part of support groups, where everybody is just like, I wish for your best health, and know you're you know going through shit man, right now, because I've been there. Um, that's a connection. I think we're doing it here right now. Um, I 
certainly see danger and I see challenge, but I also see possibility. And um, I thank everybody here for uh, listening and, uh, you know, trying to connect. Thanks. Um, go ahead, Stuart. Thanks so much. Um, I want to I want to start uh, by by reading um, the yesterday's Zen quote, which I think is wonderful. <laughs> In this living world, the body I give up and burn would be wretched if I thought of myself as anything but firewood. <laughs> I think that's just a wonderful kind of philosophical construct, uh, and and moves us off of our own uh, ego. Now, that being said, I think we've, we've come through a period of great luxury. Uh, great luxury meaning to live in a, in a democracy and, and, and to be able to, you know, kind of flourish in some ways in democracy. But I think we've come to the end of that rope. As, as I've looked at, at, at um, you know, history, I see that the greatest mass social changes happened because of autocracy. Um, and I can't believe I'm about to say this, but, but, but I, I know, Gil, you, you, you could disagree and many would disagree and that's okay. You know, that's, it's okay. But continual disagreement is gonna have us go over the cliff. <laughs> some benevolent, quote, dictator or some other term to kind of massively organize where we are and, 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 and make a plan to move us forward, okay? My hubris would, you know, volunteer for the program, but, you know, it doesn't look like people will, will put me in charge in, the, in this lifetime. But we, we know what the challenges are. We know what to do. It's a question of organization. And, and meanwhile, you know, so much of the activities we're engaged in are, are you know, fiddling while Rome is burning. Um, and here we are. I'm struck by that phrase that we know what to do. I hear it all the time. I don't think we know what to do. <laughs> uh, it, we need to cut uh, CO2. And cutting CO2 means cutting some kind of commercial or domestic activities. Uh, I look around my room right now and there's power going to the computer. There's an electric heater. Uh, there are two kitties uh, that eat food out of a can, which has to be manufactured. And that um, stuff in the can has to be grown. Uh, I see a, a dozen projects that are going to be undertaken slowly, like uh, wiring a, uh, a plug that seems to come disconnected. Uh, none of them are in the spirit of cutting CO2. They all add to it. Um, and I'm just puzzled uh, with this idea that we know what to do. I think if we knew what to do, we'd have a very different, different conversation. I don't think we know what to do. Some of it is uh, all of a sudden, I think, Doug, just putting a stop to all those activities and to live in a way that's much more, you know, close to the land. Um, and that's why I keep going back to we don't have the political or, in, or in individual will to actually um, do that. But I think that, that, that if, you, if you brought a group of people together, you know, they could say, we need to do this, 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 and this, and speculated without regard to the cost or the transition um, or the uh, changes in, in the way people are living. Um, massive, massive, massive difference. Um, you know, as if we, if we all went out on a camping trip, okay? Um, or I remember years ago, there was a, a, a somebody who said, you know, I could live in Central Park and just went out into Central Park in New York and was able to forage for food, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, we're, 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 we are so far from ready to do that, but that's the kind of action that I think, you know, needs to happen. But what well, do I- Going out on a camping trip, you know, it's gonna take a, a vehicle to get us there. Uh, that's gonna use gasoline. We'll walk. Gil? Yeah, I don't think you can fit all of New York and Central Park, Stuart. Um, 
I'm 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 of the perspective that we actually know a lot about what to do. This has been sort of the core of my orientation and work for the last 50 years since doing World Game with Bucky and the crew, which confirmed for me that we could be successful on this planet, that we're not constrained by resources. Um, but there's other things in the way than that. Um, Doug, you and I disagree on that. Um, uh, but, you know, your wiring of your plug and feeding your kitties is a pretty small piece of the problem. Well, actually, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm uh, wiring your plug. Let's leave the kitties out of it. Kitties are part of the problem. But, you know, we, we need to look at a sense of proportion about where the scale of the damage comes from. And so was it like 70% uh, of, of, of global emissions are the result of 100 companies' activities? So we can start to get strategic about things and think about other ways of doing plugs. And um, um, you know, if 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 I if I mine the copper with with coal powered energy or renewable powered energy, the impacts are different down the road. Um, so that's a whole conversation we could have at another time, perhaps. But to Stuart, your your dream of autocracy. Um, which Doug, I've heard you speak about. Uh, you've heard you speak about it also. Um, um, is to me is very flawed for a couple of reasons. One is that you know it's not true that only social changes only come out of autocratic activity, um, and we can cite you know lots and lots of examples of other ways that that has happened. In fact, out of deny a challenge to or to autocratic activity, but the the logical flaw in that argument is. Who the fuck is the benevolent autocrat and who's choosing them? And so that dead ends that strategy pretty quickly. I mean, it may happen at random. Um, you know, there was a while where people thought Elon Musk might be a good contributor to that. I don't think anybody's thinking that this, this week, right? So um, um, the autocrat theory breaks for me on, on Ashby's law of requisite variety. You know, nobody with that much power can be aware of what they need to be aware of to do what needs to be done. So you know, for me, that's a dead end. We need to go find some other path than getting an autocrat or living in Central Park off the land. By the way, um, you know, one of the things that people have argued for a long time is zero population growth or declining population, too many people on earth. China appears to be on a verge of demo demographic collapse, um, which, you know, some people say great less resource load, but on the other hand, less people to make stuff and less people to pay taxes and so demographic collapse, economic collapse. Um, so anyway, I'll, I'll stop there. I, I just need to say, Gil, thank you for taking my bait. I'm, I'm, being, a I'm being a provocateur is what I'm doing, okay? I'm, I'm, I'm half awake enough to just fall into the traps. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not saying that you know, this is the only way, but I think in the discussion, it's important to look at that as 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 you know potential option. And and Elon Musk did cross my mind also. He and he and you know Donald Trump saying you know Trump saying I could I can I can fix everything. And, and we thought Musk was going to be part of the answer, but you know he's driven himself off the cliff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if I may come back to uh, Doug's point, uh, do we actually know what to do? I mean, the reason why I, I really uh, love Theory U, that whole concept, is because what we typically do is we identify there is a problem, there is, a, there is an issue here, and then we jump over to, okay, here must be the solutions. And what we don't do is go the curve of exploration to really understand the problem. So we... We don't lack solutions, we lack understanding of problems. Because when you see what uh, the, the tech world comes up with, these are not solutions to the problem the way uh, most of us understand them. So they're fixing stuff without understanding the systemic relationships of the uh, issues that they're playing with, right? You're playing with a complex adaptive system. So any any anything you do in that system requires you to have a deep understanding of the moving parts that you are impacting within that system, and that's what we're disconnecting. You know, we're spending literally they're spending billions of dollars when you look at the World Economic Forum on stuff that just makes no sense, and in fact, in most cases, makes stuff worse. Right? So why is that? It's because 
the, the nature of the problem is not being accepted there is almost like like a emotional uh, rejection right because it implies the need to change at a profound level that uh, uh that that changes uh, business models you know at a level that um people who are uh, in charge of those things simply uh, can't even imagine uh, uh, wrapping their mind around so no we don't we don't have a solution problem we have a, a definition problem of what is the problem yeah. i'm yeah. going to uh come in here and say a word about the process and then have Ken do his poem after a discussion about the process. Uh, several things um, that I, I ran a thing at Stanford for a while called the, the Stanford Strategy Studio. And the idea was to experiment in how to have better adult conversations. Uh, and I learned a lot from that, of which the stuff today is a part. The reason to have uh, each person speak is it really changes a person's perception of themselves if they have heard themselves speak in the group. Uh, it's really quite powerful and it prevents, um, well, the other thing by going around the room and getting what's been on everybody's mind is it opens up onto multiple agendas and prevents the tendency groups have to want to narrow down to a single topic in order to lower the anxiety from all the issues. Uh, today was a fairly good example of doing this, although there seems to me a stiltedness in, in the rooms, in the room, so to speak. But I think that's coming from the existential situation we're in and not anything about the group process. So those are some thoughts. Um, any reactions to doing things this way? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, th I'm thinking of the Abalone Alliance consensus process, which basically, um, and there's other consensus processes that I've researched on um, the net. And basically, there are processes, you know, always have a facilitator in, in, as well as uh, a leader. Um, Ken uh, and I have had conversations about, you know, um, his, you know, conscious conversations as well. I think... Um, you know, human training, uh, we can learn how to do this. Um, and thanks. I, I just posted to the list earlier this morning, uh, um, a piece about how can a, how can a business with four times the revenue per square foot of its surrounding businesses with 10,000 workers and no CEO operate. Yeah. So other models out there. Yeah, Doug, I thought it, I thought it worked well. Um, it, 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 it at times verged on being a conversation. Um, the hand raising is something, it's a practice I think we're used to, but I think we would be better off if we all learned how to be respectful in terms of time so that there could be more uh, real interaction. Any other comments on the process? I mean, in a way the, the process is aimed at being almost inconspicuous uh, so that things happen fairly naturally. Um, the idea that we're having a consensus conversation, in a way this method is to avoid a consensus too early uh, and to open up uh, to the groups, uh, many pseudopodia out into the reality we're living in. If there's no more comments, uh, Ken, you want to give us a poem about? Actually, I was going to comment on something else, not about the process, but uh, Stuart said he has a poem, so I will defer to Stuart for a poem. Oh, that's right. I'm sorry. Okay. Stuart? Sure, I'll share the poem. I was also going to briefly comment, very briefly, on what Klaus was saying. Um, the whole notion of... Um, people's opinions are based upon their underlying psychology and value set. And the only way that I think we're going to progress forward is if our leaders had the capacity to be reflective enough in that way to see that they're operating within the system and they need to get out of the system 
uh, in order to uh, produce some real value going forward. Okay. Um, Stuart, Stuart yeah. before you go, I, I actually feel compelled to, to share what I was gonna share before, which is I've been observing in this conversation that all agency appears to be centered in humans. And we are in a living world where there are all kinds of entities that have tremendous agency that we're ignoring. And um, until we can actually come to grips with that and feel it in ourselves, we're going to continue to try and reinvent. Uh, we're going to continue to try and get out of the box we're in by, by feeling the walls of the box going, okay, we have to break through this. I don't think that actually works. I think we need some very new thinking. So rather than an engineering approach of how do we solve this, I have the question of what does a, a human level immune response to, we have humans currently are an autoimmune disease on the planet. You know, we have, we have violated so many of the biological and natural um, quote laws that are out there that we have put ourselves in the position of being on the verge of extinction. So what does an immune response, not an engineered response, an immune response that comes, sweeps over the entire organism and wakes it up and has it, has it live at a different level? Has it produce a different kind of um, reaction? I think is the question that for me is more interesting than how do we solve our problems? Thank you. I'll be quiet now. And, 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 and contrary to what I said before about a uh, uh, one person you know, running the whole show, the bubbling up um, that happens when we're in, in conversation and dialogue at a, at a deeper level is where the solutions may come from. So the part where the silence is more important than the speaking. So the poem is called Partnering. Agreements all over the place. Don't pay attention, conflicts to face. Guiding, grounding, focused collaboration, producing results beyond expectation. Expressing joint vision and a plan, build trust with woman and man. Alignment enables states of grace with the gift of agreement in place. Alone, don't do much, stumble about. Harnessed in tandem, we become stout. Hook up talents to a group with a mission, marvel the results of a shared vision. Partnerships grounded in covenant light you up with energy abundant. Connect with people at work, be clear with loved ones, don't be a jerk. Know what you are, what you're about, join with others, stand back and shout. Amazed and thrilled with delight, joyous teamwork makes your life bright. Outcomes beyond what you had in mind, Life force of traction wells up, you find. Satisfaction fills your heart. Joining others, life becomes art. Thank you. Ken, do you want to do a poem? No, I think we should just sit with Stuart Sports. Good. <laughs> Then I have to actually I'm prepared to hear that poem again. Then I have to head off the call, so I'm going to uh, turn the con, con over to Ken. But thank you all, and Doug, thank you for for running the session. Yeah, I'll thank post you. it in our in our in our email thread. <laughs> thank you. Excellent. Thank okay. you. Bye all. And and, and uh, <laughs> I was going to say. I was almost moved to say to Doug when he asked Ken if he had a poem. What's the matter, Doug? Mine wasn't good enough. <laughs> I think that expression that is what are, what am I, a chopped liver? <laughs> <laughs> it was a good point. <laughs> you don't like the red tie. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like people are leaving. Good to see you all. Have a wonderful week. Um, see you next week, I hope. Take care. Right, don't close the con yet. Can I want to grab the chat? Okay. Everybody wants the chat, go ahead and get it before I close the meeting. Got it. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Thanks, everybody. All right. Adios.
And, uh, um, hey, Ken, good to see you. Good to see you, Mark. Yeah, it's been a long time. Um, it has. How's your uh, How's your wet weather and uh, hillside and everything? We're We're doing okay where I am. We have not had any uh, any flooding here in San Rafael, but you know you don't have to go very far to find some no. pretty pretty nasty stuff out here. No, I mean I I know uh, in past um, uh, rain, um, you know, all kinds of stuff has happened in Fairfax and along, you know, um, 